to the 47th episode of the Animal Riot Podcast, brought to you by Animal Riot Press, a literary press for books that matter. I'm Katie Rainey, filling in for Brian Birnbaum while he's taking some time off. And today I've got with me some of the best writer pals a gal like me could ask for, Jennifer Werbitsky and Melissa Shaw. Hello. Hi. And here comes Rosetta to interrupt us. We brought the dog. Two broads and a dog. Two broads and a dog. That's now the name of this episode. (laughs) Jennifer Werbitsky is a New York City-based writer who was born in Manhattan and raised in rural area of South Buffalo. She is currently working to bridge the gaps between rural and urban communities through agricultural regeneration. A lot of words that I'm struggling to pronounce right now on this wine. In the U.S., during her time at Cornell University, she studied creative writing in French and spent time as a translator in Paris. Bonjour. 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 (laughs) (laughs) Melissa Shaw is a writer, theater artist, and educator who offers a unique consultancy based in the arts, social justice, diversity, and inclusion, and social emotional learning. Wow, that's a lot of words. She has taught or led sessions in universities, schools, summer camps, detention centers, yeshivas, churches, corporate offices, and long-term temporary housing centers. No big deal. She has facilitated Hmm. workshops for high school students, security guards, chaplains, nonprofit managers, video game designers, Buddhist monks, Buddhist monks, (laughs) school principals, other adults, NGO leaders, and the NYPD. God damn, Melissa, this bio is way bigger than the other one. <laughs> That's <laughs> stacked, yeah. She is a teaching artist and creative coach for various community-based organizations, including Community Word Project, What What, and the Lulu and Leo Fund. Melissa also facilitates for a variety of the Anti-Defamation League's programs, including a World of Difference Institute, Words to Actions, Echoes and Reflections, Respect for All Initiatives. She was on faculty for Drew University's 2018 Institute on Religion and Conflict Transformation, where she helped to foster dialogue among religions and lay leaders from around the world. Last summer, Melissa was a part of the prestigious Nahum. Nahum. Goldman Fellowship Cohort. She is an associate artist with Falcon Works Artist Group. She is nicknamed Boots. She holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence. Welcome, Melissa Shaw. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> All right, so now I have to here. tell the story of why you are named Boots. You I, don't even remember. No, I do remember. I said it on our other podcast, like nine months ago so if you don't follow me on the other podcast you can check out rose all day anyways anyway melissa boots shaw is named boots henceforth because we were writing instructors together at sarah lawrence the esteemed sarah lawrence college and there was a child whose parent was quite erratic and did things that were you know that we did not expect and the boot became our signifier for this parent is doing some crazy ass shit. Yeah. Did you agree? It That's gave us it a code. We, we were allowed a code. Yeah. That way we could speak in, in, in tongues yes. together silently without anyone knowing what we were talking about. Out yeah. loud. Silently out loud. Because when you teach children, you have to have like signifiers with other adults. You have to have some codes that they know that shit's going down. That's right. That's right. That's exactly what happened. Well, I'm very excited to have both of you because <clears throat> you two are my writing group pals that we were formed out of like after a reading one day and just decided we we would get together so we've been doing this what like a year now yeah it's a beautiful like fortuitous moment Mm -hmm. just great minds coming together and meeting occasionally and writing yeah when we can we're all like scattered but we've written some really cool things and gotten to share it with each other which has been really fun yeah and we're all we have we've both got overlap and we're different so it's really nice to be able to support each other mm. are you guys part of any other writing group no i have a friend who i will occasionally sit and do like a jam with we'll write we'll do some exercises or maybe we'll do some improv together and just get our juices flowing like we might just pick up a topic and just start jamming on it and see what happens it's kind of fun Okay. We haven't done it in a minute, and tonight was the first night we've had writing group in a while, although there was no writing shared. Oh, you you shared some writing, Jen. 
Yeah, there was um, some poetry that made its way into the... <laughs> Which was your knowledge. like first poem that you've really tried to get published. So Sub- yeah, there. yeah, I have this aspiration to add the phrase amateur Antarctic poet to <laughs> <laughs> to my bio. So this is a stab Okay, now you, get, you got to qualify that now. Yeah. Why? why? Yeah, so I, I had the experience of traveling to Antarctica in March 2019, through my other love running. And so I went down there to run a marathon through a series of strange and incredibly fortuitous events and realized that that place, the expanse of that place, the blank canvas nature of a continent made entirely of ice where humans have only been for a uh, hundred years, it just seemed like a good place to do some writing and to continue that theme after I returned here to earth, the normal earth. So there was a a poetry competition back in November, submitted a small piece, which hopefully might be accepted. We'll find out in February, but I think that won't be the last of it and that maybe there's some more writing to be done on the theme of the Great White Expanse and the Continent of Ice. So that's what's maybe coming next. We'll see. Well, and so I want to add how you found us. So I've already said like how Melissa and I know each other. Mm-hmm. We we go by, way back teaching together. But you found us through a really interesting way that I think we should talk about. How did you find us? Yeah, so I have a very full-time job and don't get to write as much as I can. And I'm not really involved in many other writing communities. And so there was one Sunday where I had this urge. I was thinking that I hadn't really made space and time for writing. So I canceled all my plans. I said, I'm going to DTUT, the cafe on the Upper East Side, not far from where I live, to do some writing. It's a Sunday. I'm just going to sit there and something great is going to come of these few hours that I'm going to dedicate to pen and paper. And then I show up and am told by the MC that if you're here for the reading please come to the back. And if not, please be quiet. And I was really intrigued. I was already in a comfy seat with a good view and was so enchanted to hear people live performing their work, artists and writers reading their stories, poetry, and thought, well, this is a community of people I want to get to know better. So I think that that was the night that this writing group started. It was because Melissa and I, (coughs) 2.6 seconds before you came up and introduced yourself, Melissa and I were like, we really need a writing group. And we just have never started one. And it should be like a group of, you know, the gals that all know each other. And we should get together and we should be accountable. Because honestly, I have not had that since my MFA, where I had like a group, like a group that I was accountable to with my writing. And then you happened to walk up and you were like, I'm Jen. What's going on here? I want to write. <laughs> and we're like, oh, you should, you should join this writing group we just made up out of thin air. And then that happened. That's what happened. That's how we got our little writing group here. That's yeah. Like destiny. We, it's kind of like a duet, duet, duet machina. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Somehow we've kept it, even though, like, I will say, like, a lot of people start writing groups, but, you know, things fall off and everything. And, and obviously, we've had, like, giant months where we were like, oh, my God, so much shit's happening. Like, I have no writing. I can't do anything. But we just, like, kept talking and kept sharing. We even met over Google Hangouts a couple of times because we could not physically get in person because <laughs> you, Jen, are on the Upper East Side and you, Melissa, are in Brooklyn. I'm in the bowels of mm-hmm. Brooklyn. Yeah, I'm down there. I'm like <clears throat> like a little bit past the colon, but like mm. not quite to the duodenum. So I'm like way down there. And I'm here in beautiful, glorious West Harlem, which you guys have traveled to tonight. And so it's hard to get together, especially when you're just like, a teacher and you work in like multiple jobs you're a freelance writer you like do i mean or just are a human in new york city Mm. because there's a million different things going on every night and so we've tried to digitally or in person carve out space for one another and create this writing group and so here we are now we're recording this podcast after we've been sitting here together for two hours catching up and drinking wine so if there are some slip of the tongues here by on my part, that's because of the Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, you're about to get some like drunk insight for your Saturday evening 
listening or whatever day you're listening. So that's how we, we've all met. I'd like to hear a little bit about your writing careers and where you guys come from. I said some, some, some stuff in your bio. And I know, Melissa, that you have a story for us, which, which got us to all record this episode because you started telling the story. And I said, this story needs to be recorded on air. So I didn't let you finish the story. So maybe you want to tell it now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of great, right, to be able to, to tease a story and get everyone interested and exciting, uh, excited and then be able to finish it. So, all right. So for me, you know, I started really in undergrad. I studied a lot of fiction writing along alongside of my uh, studying of theater. And then when I graduated and I moved to New York, I was doing some writing for some like culture bot, great example of an online magazine about theater. And there was a great website for a while called grid skipper so i was doing some writing for them and then i really threw myself more heavily into my solo performance writing so i do a kind of like a lot of like on stage memoir personal narrative long form monologue work i I came out of the stand-up kind of world and then found that sometimes it's okay if things are not funny and and found a way to kind of make art around that. Yeah, so recently I've been doing a, a little bit more essay writing and you did you had a couple great essays come out? Yeah. You want to say what they are? Yeah. Well, I I, I did a piece about white supre- growing up Jewish in in a town where I was, you know, one of the there were two Jews in my high school and my experience, um, my high school was just in the news for swastikas and the water polo team doing Nazi salutes. So I wrote a response piece to that. And then I just wrote a piece about comparing our generational dilemma, our generational dilemmas around climate change all through the lens of the never ending story. Um, Which a piece I have called okay nothing. I have to check in with Jen right now because when you <laughs> oh, no. sh- when you shared that essay, Jen had of that moment not watched Never Ending Story and I take by your face you've still not watched it. I I purchased it on YouTube. Okay. Three ninety nine. I have thirty days to start it. Great. That did not happen this week. It would have happened at the expense of sleep and it was already really late. So I, I have fine. to I, and I was told I was gonna cry a lot and I was not in a crying a lot mood at any point this week I wonder if you'd cry in your 30s the way that you cried when you were like no no way it's totally different I it's cry at every kind of like every movie it's like a running yeah. joke that even funny movies that have no crying parts I will cry at like, so ha- I Happy Gilmore did cry <laughs> yeah. at Happy Gilmore yeah they're gonna take his grandma's house it's so sad it is sad <laughs> did you cry at Bridesmaids <gasps> probably I think everyone I literally cried okay. All right, all right, I get it, I get it, I get it. But what I really appreciate is that you invested $4 in watching that movie. And now I have probably 26 days to watch it. So because it's forthcoming. Because of your essay. Tick, tick. It's forthcoming. Because of your yeah, essay. yeah, you've, you've already inspired different behavior. <laughs> so I've recently been inspired to get back more firmly into comedy. And so I actually signed up for a sketch writing class, which I've never done an official sketch writing class. And I have my first sketch writing assignment. I'm studying at the Magnet, which I really want to tell people if you're listening to this and you're like, I want to study improv or storytelling or sketch or whatever. Where do I go? There's so many places in New York. I just want to say I like the Magnet because it's really trans inclusive. It's super friendly to people who identify as female. It's queer friendly. The instructors are just, I, th- I think that they have just a radical, a, a philosophy of radical inclusion that I, I think they, re- I think they mean it. You know, some people say it and I really feel like they mean it. So I, I just want to give a shout out to the magnet. I feel good about going there. But anyway, so I was trying to figure out what do I, you know, one of the things when I teach a class on activism, I do a lot of arts and activism education. And a lot of my background is in being in the streets, staying in the streets, yelling in the streets, making a scene in the streets, or sometimes the Senate building in DC. Like, what do you, what do you give a fuck about, right? I don't know if we can say that on the air, but uh, that's my big yeah, question, we don't right? Give a fuck. Well, yeah. Katie doesn't <laughs> give a fuck that I just said that. No. So. so I'm sitting here, I'm like, what is a sketch that is going to be something that also kind of takes on? you know, a social something, something that's happening in our, in our world around us. So I just started kind of getting excited about an idea of like, what if there was a sketch around a, an Apple rollout, like Apple is about to roll out a new product and uh, we're all in the audience to be witness to it. And we get introduced and, you know, it's couched in people getting excited around like good, strong, good old fashioned tech language. I love the idea of it being good old fashioned tech language because now it's become such the norm. But anyway, we meet Tim Cook, 
comes on stage a la like a TED talk, right? Comes walking to the podium. And Tim Cook is wearing a, a signature black turtleneck, which I think he just stole off the body of like Steve Jobs. Like I think he literally never did that. And then he was like, I'll just steal Steve Jobs. Tur- it comes turtleneck. with a job title. Yeah. Oh, it's like, yeah. When you, yeah. When you become the head the of Apple, title. you have yeah. to wear a, uh-huh. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you have to wear a turtleneck. The same one. That's right. So anyway, he walks out, but not only is he wearing a turtleneck, he's also wearing a, he's wearing a pink, a pink satin robe, and he has a hook on his hand. He's got a hook on his hand. And he comes out and he's introducing the newest thing, and he has a box in his hand, like an iPhone box, like something you're like, it's the newest iPhone. Because, you know, the iPhone 11 that just came out is kind of like a panopticon. It's got like multiple cameras, so it's very exciting. This box... He opens it and he reveals what the newest technology is. Can we guess first? Yeah, I'd love to hear what people think. If I was writing the sketch, what it, what do you want Tim when, Cook to have in when his When you box? first started telling this story before the podcast and I said we need to record, immediately what I went to was it's some kind of mind reader because what, we, what we're doing right now with technology is getting more and more progressively like AI related, right? And so I was like, okay, it's something like mind reader related. Like it's something that can read your partner's thoughts when you're not like figuring out what they want. I don't know. That's, that's where my brain went to. I don't know. What about you, Jen? Oh, I, love it. I didn't know there was a hook on Tim Cook's hand. When you were first telling yeah, you this. You didn't tell that in the first that, place. I left that book. is a critical detail. Because now I'm thinking hand in the box. <laughs> or I'm thinking like alligator that took off his hand a la Peter Pan. I'm, I'm going the absurd route here. But in more serious tones when you were first describing this it's it seems like we're we're just waiting with bated breath for that moment when the next reveal is something that's finally going to fulfill us that's finally going to almost replace us so i i do like katie's suggestion of mind reading technology of something that is going to make humans obsolete because it seems like each progressive iphone just replaces more and more of the other things you could possibly want in your pocket and so I think the human mind, something closer to the human mind is coming next. What I love about this is that I, I'm now I'm feeling an instinct to prolong how long we don't know what comes out of the box, that we leave whatever's in the box in the box for as long Maybe as Maybe till the end of the episode? Yeah, I don't think I'm Ooh. going to tell you until as, as, and I think I'm maybe writing this as we're... I think the sketch is getting written as we're doing this podcast. Okay. So. Maybe if you hear me shout out random objects during the podcast, it's me guessing <laughs> interspersed what else it could be. Yeah, like so actually, I wonder if this is in the box, right? Like, oh, okay. I actually wonder. All right, okay. Yeah. Mm. So I, I'm going to let everyone know what I was thinking, and uh, and then maybe maybe actually this is a good editing moment where I'm going to come up with an even better idea for my sketch for my class. Well, so since we're a writing group, We've also been a reading group, right? What book did we read together? Do you guys remember Oh, that? my goodness. What, what book was the that? The Fever Dream book. The Fever oh, Dream. That's right. Wow. We all liked it. <sighs> yeah, yeah, that was a really good book. That was one of the best things I read me. in 2019. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I, I have. are you guys parts of any, like, are you a part of any other book groups? A book club right now? Not yeah. right now. No. no. I feel like all that stuff happens digitally now. Mm. Like I, I am technically part of other book groups on like Goodreads and stuff. But like hmm. if I read the book, it's debatable. Like if I have time or whatever, or if I'm into the book at all. But we actually sat down and we're like, no, we're doing an in-person thing. And we really only have interactions in person at this point. Like we text now. We have a group thread. But that's mostly just like logistical getting together and so i'm just like wondering what you guys think about the relevancy of like writing groups and book clubs because we are one Mm. and so what that means to you guys and like why we're just three people like we've talked about inviting other people but 
and we have actually invited other people into our group, but they just couldn't make it. I know there's a couple of people I was like, oh, yeah, you should come join us. But they just couldn't get in. For some reason, we've stuck to the three of us and we're like, no, we're doing this. And it's staying alive. <laughs> so why is that? And like, what's the relevancy of writing groups and reading groups? Well, I think that even when we're not meeting regularly or our, our own individual lives have to take precedence over sticking to committed one time a month or whatever another group might be I've I've appreciated that it's very fluid and even if I'm not getting regular feedback or even if we're not in person together as often as we could be just knowing that there is Katie and Melissa out there in the ether creating and like hoping that I am creating and wanting the best for me in that process just like fuels me fuels me in my writing and knowing that there is a place to turn when I have a finished product or when I'm stuck and yeah just kind of a mutual appreciation that this just exists and the fact that it just exists in real life offline online when it needs to is really really good good for the writing soul yeah, I want to say that it's the kind of feeling where at least one person has heard this piece. At least I know two people like it or mm. are having an opportunity to interact with it. So it's just really nice, like even if something is struggling to find a home um, in terms of being published, at least you have some people who can give you some like real honest feedback and enjoy it and give you a laugh or an aha moment from a piece of your writing. So I think that there's... But it's different. It's different than like doing that because there are plenty of groups that meet digitally and that do this online. And like you could do that easily. Like I have plenty of like Twitter friends that I've never met in person who have read my writing and have given me feedback. But there's like something different about like meeting in person and doing this. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's about community. I mean, I know that there's online community and I know the community gets created uh, in the internet. But do you know, I actually have a whole new philosophy about a modern misanthropic thread that is running through human existence right now. And I really think that we're, we're in the age of the modern misanthrope. And I think a lot of the hatred of other people or fear of other people or anger towards other people is be is being, I think, proliferated because of the internet. Because you don't see a person's face. It's so easy to like bash someone or yell at someone. And so I think we're becoming a nerd to yeah. human eye contact. And I think the the pulse of, of being in a room with someone and actually like in real time. So I think it's crucial to be able to get off the off the web and into a space together. I can absolutely relate in a way that you two know and that no one listening knows to not meeting someone in person and dealing with the aftermath right now. I think if if you had to look someone in the eyes, you would behave very differently towards them. Yep. Like for every action that they take and that you take, there's something about that really human connection that's actually in my latest short story I'm working on is that the power mm. of the eye contact and what that does to your behavior. Is that story finished? Not quite. It's written, but it's one of the ones where I wake up every day and I'm like, oh, there's so much more I want to do here. There's a lot more recrafting to be done. I think I wasn't prepared for how long it takes to rework something once it's technically written. So it's in that stage. (laughs) Writing is rewriting. Yeah, exactly. Well, so do you two, do you, what kind of writers do you consider yourself? Short story writers, novelists, essay writers, poets, anything in particular or multi? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I really, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm a pretty interdisciplinary artist in general, but I love the idea of like micro memoir. So Mm. like short memoir pieces. I don't know if anybody else considers that a a genre. Creative nonfiction. When I think, you know, it's funny. I, I've, I've come to love the term. I've come to love the term. But when creative nonfiction first came out, I think it was in reaction to the James Frey controversy. I oh, think a lot of... Which I, one? <laughs> uh, the one about a million little pieces, right? And people were like, well, we need a new genre called creative nonfiction mm. so that people understand that, that there's this space where memory... Memory and creativity have a dance that they do. So, um, yeah. I I really like being... When I talk about when people are like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a humorist. Like, I like considering yeah, myself you say a that humorist. Lot. I love that. And I think Chuck Klosterman, I don't know if anyone's familiar with like sex, drugs, and Cocoa Puffs, or we might be wrong. Uh, what, if, what if we're wrong? Pardon me. 
Sorry, Chuck. It was his most latest, the latest book that I read. He has another one out that I haven't read yet. He was this real Gen X writer that was talking about like music and TV and all this stuff. He predated me. I, I consider myself a zenial. He's solidly Gen X, but I consider myself a zenial. So I would love to be the zenial version of like a Chuck Klosterman mixed maybe with a little bit more politics with some like Naomi Klein kind of stuff, but through a lens that's, you know, a little cheeky and a little wry. Um, that's kind of the market I'm trying to corner. If if you if you have a magazine in which you'd like me published, definitely reach out. I'll I'll give you my email <laughs> after the show. And for those of you who don't know what a zenial is, check out oh. Melissa's latest piece. Oh, okay, nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can see it on Medium. But yeah, I'm like from that little micro generation that lives between Gen X and Millennial. Like we don't have a home. We're actually like the kind of like wandering the wandering mendicants of the generational world. Nobody wants us. Nobody wants to claim us. We uh, we don't necessarily want to say that we're part of any one group, but we grew up with like dial up, and we grew up at the very infancy of the internet being in people's homes. Like for the for the for the average person, not for like the super cool nerd who had the internet in the seventies. I'm not talking about you. And, you know, and we grew up kind of with that sense of like, okay, the Cold War was ending and the wall came down in 89 and we watched that. And we were definitely the kind of generation that like are not necessarily digital natives, but we can speak the language. And I think that we had an, what did, what did people say? Analog childhood, digital adulthood. And I just think there's also kind of this, we have just have this like fun grumpiness about us that we watch the world continue to push into this robotic AI, you know, I don't want to say hellscape because I, I don't, I'm, I consider myself an optimist, but you know, I mean, we don't know how it's going to go. So there's kind of a little bit of a distance that we have towards what everybody else just has accepted from birth. Well, because we're at like the halfway mark, I'm wondering if one of you wants to share your writing first so that we can, we can jump off the conversation from there. I think I will because it's probably better than my bio in that like it, probably tells you everything you need to know about what are you gonna read in life i'm gonna read an excerpt from a short story called the llama which i read during a dead rabbits reading night thanks for the invite katie and this is something that you've quote unquote workshopped i don't know if i like that term workshopped but that you've shared with us during our little writing group too yeah exactly and the genesis of this was it came out of a doodle I did at 3 a.m. in my journal, which has been most of my writing, when I was still in the office working on a late night. So corporate workaholic has kind of been my writing background. But this is how I dealt with it. So, so here's the beginning of the llama. They hired a llama to replace Jim. Everyone agreed it was for the better, but then the llama turned out to be a total asshole. My first year at Net Impact High Growth Miracle Fund had been marked by Jim's sudden mood changes and tirades. Even minor formatting errors had triggered threats and shouting rampages. So when the firm announced that llama was under consideration for the vice president position, I felt something no analyst is ever supposed to feel. Hope. The llama had an advanced degree in corporate proficiency, and they only had to pay him in hay, so he had shot to the top of the candidate pool. For a bonus, management had offered wheatgrass shots on days of excellent performance. And since performance at the manager level was supposedly measured on the attitude scale, but in reality was tied to the volume of work produced by subordinates, we were completely at his inhuman mercy. On his first day, the llama clip-clopped up and down the hall, bleeding orders without stopping to explain them. When the printer jammed the next week, he bashed his head on the side of the machine until it let out a series of high-pitched beeps. It was too terrifying to laugh. Why did the firm think this was a good idea? I complained to Mark. The juniors hate him. He always drops work on us late at night before going back to the corporate stables. And he can't even use a normal bathroom. He shits in that special hole they installed in the corner of his office. Mark shrugged. He brings in deals. After a few weeks of frustration, I decided to try and get on the llama's good side. I stopped by his office after lunch on Friday. Hey there, any special plans for the weekend? I asked. He stared at me blankly for a moment. Do you have that report yet? I panicked, then remembered. 
Yeah, the 32-page report, I sent it to you last night. No, my blood froze. No, I asked for an investment judgment memo, which required a 33-page memo. Yours is irrelevant. Start over. But get out. I turned to go. Oh, and Samson? He continued in a reading aloud voice. Have a good weekend and don't spend too much time on it. This phrase was written on a handout that management had distributed after the Rod scandal. Mark had found an extra copy jammed in the printer. The handout was entitled, How to Motivate Analysts and Avoid Costly Legal Quagmires. The memo's mascot, Swampy the Cheerleader, guided managers through helpful phrases and quirky quagmire tips to force junior staff to do more work, while appearing to inspire and provide good growth opportunities. This was one of Swampy's favorite phrases, and it had been readily adopted around the office. I wondered if the llama was already getting complaints of abuse or if he was just being proactive. Returning to my cubicle corner, I logged into my meal tablet to order from the firm's takeout food delivery service for dinner. The one joy they couldn't take away from me was eating, and even the llama had to do it. Mark, I shouted, where's food, kitchen, ink, burritos? He came stumbling into my office breathless. I don't know, man, the tablets must be malfunctioning. I don't see grease pizza in a box either. One new restaurant had replaced the other two. Alfalfa barn feed and follies, Mark read. There's nothing edible on the menu. The specials included the Kentucky bluegrass plate, third cut hay, and the I can't believe it's not grain diet option of the day. You know who's behind this, I said quietly. From the other side of the thin wall between my cubicle and the elevators came the sound of the llama's hooves on the marble floor, then a clunk as he slammed his head against the down button. A second later, I heard a chaotic clanging of metal, like a box of gongs falling off a truck. The llama let fly a series of strong expletives. He must have backed up into the decorative suits of armor again. I sighed and noticed the light was on in Dan's office. He was second in command at Net Impact High Growth Miracle Fund and had authored the swampy memo. I knocked on his door and a voice boomed, Enter. He was working on a finger painting when I walked in. I'm I'm sorry, sir. I, I can come back at a better time. No need. Look, isn't this great? He held up an impressionistic interpretation of what looked like a pheasant hunt. Skip Jones is going to love this. Just closed on his second fund, and I thought I'd send him a note. He was in my section at business school. I nodded. So, how can I help you, son? Well, I'm concerned about the llama. Me too. He's making everyone else look bad. Have you seen his numbers? I paused. Of course you haven't. We don't show the juniors. But let me assure you, I had my doubts at first, too. We've never hired outside the human species before, but at least we haven't started hiring women on the investing team. (laughs) He let out a hearty laugh. But why a llama? Putting aside his finger painting, he sighed and continued. Let me make this very clear to you. Human emotions get in the way of good business decisions, but animal instincts are necessary to succeed in the markets and go in for the kill. You want to succeed in this business, don't you? An image of the llama with a bloody severed arm hanging from its jaw popped into my head. Dan burst out laughing and concluded, Besides, we pay you humans too much. Now get out of my office. My finger paints are drying out. I got up to leave. Oh, and feel free to stop by any time, he said, reading off a piece of paper taped to his desk. Thank you, sir, I mumbled. When I checked my phone, I had 68 unread messages from the llama, all of which concluded with, how soon do you think you can get this done? Man, it's been like a year since we, I think, read that story, right? Has it been that long? I feel like. Wow. And it's just as funny as the first time that I read it. Oh but gosh. it's even better because you just read it out loud to me. It's like a bedtime story. <laughs> yeah, I heard a lot more in it this time. Too, yeah, because when you hear somebody read it, it's a lot different. Yeah. Yeah. Where did this idea come from? So I was trying to use humor to make sense of a job that was pretty merciless when it came to being a human, wanting a personal life, having hours outside the office. And so there was one night when I think it was a Friday night, it was past midnight, I was still in the office and the VP I was working with on a deal had an office not far from mine and he heard me on the phone with my mother and sent me an email saying you really need to focus on this get back to work 
mm-hmm. for being on the phone with my mom at like, I don't know, 1 a.m. on a Friday night. Wow. And so just the absurdity of the situation kind of made me rethink how things were playing out. Uh, yeah, it, it was just kind of crazy to me. So I don't even actually remember the context, but I just doodled in my notebook this llama wearing a pinstripe suit saying like do you have those papers yet in a speech bubble and then like a year or two later that turned into this whole story Mm -hmm. of like everyone's had that terrible boss everyone's been in that situation where like is it just me am i am i crazy that these demands are being placed upon me yeah and i think the only way i can make sense of that was like it's it's almost as crazy as like working for a llama like (laughs) having someone who's just like so over the top you know what i think in all this time i don't think i heard the story about him and you you talking to your mom i don't know if i I know the story of the doodle either to be honest maybe i did but i'll send you guys a little iphone like i still have that photo i took it we're gonna need to caption it with this podcast picture Yeah. yeah yeah it's so crazy it's like, what are, what are the lifelines that get you through those moments where you can't really see the light? And that's one of the great parts of the creative process is you can be in a situation that's so absurd, that's so like, is this even reality? Is this, is this allowed to happen in real life to me or to someone I'm close to? Like, how, how is this okay? <laughs> and, then, and then to just inject something that's, that's full of humor or absurd or irrational, I think is is one way to kind of deal with the trauma that's inflicted by challenging situations that are totally outside your control. I think that that is that that's humor and comedy's best highest function. Yeah, is exactly what you just named. That's well, I why think it's really used for good and not for evil. I think we need to ask: Is a llama in the box? Okay, spoiler alert! I was waiting when, oh, until man. this moment. There is not a llama in the box. Darn. Okay. There's not a llama. I in had the a box. side bet but with I Rosetta wonder, that there was going to be a llama in that box. What if there was a a robot llama in that box? Would you A tiny robot llama? Yeah, a tiny robot llama. I want a robot Tim Cook in the box where you're not sure if the Tim Cook presenting is the Tim Cook or the box Tim Cook is okay. the real Tim Cook. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. Well, Melissa. Yeah. It's your turn. Well, all right. What are you going to read for us? Well, I could read a little bit of Okay Nothing if you wanted me to, the piece about Never Ending Story. We did start with that, so that would be appropriate. Yeah. But people can also find it on Medium under Melissa Shaw. Yep. So it's up to you. I'd be really happy to, and I can just read a little bit of it just to kind of what you're Is that what you want to read right now? Yeah. All right. Unless you have another it. idea that no. makes you excited. Any of them. You've um, published a lot this year. so That's so sweet of you to say. I don't know how true it is, but it's very sweet of you to say. And if anyone, what's your readership? How many, how many, how many readers would you say you have? 10 listeners? million, right? All mm-hmm. right. So all 10 mm-hmm. million, million of you listening to this story, please follow me. We on, were on rated Time Magazine's most popular podcast. So Okay, great. Of January 2020. Excellent. So knowing that... Translated into 32 different languages, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to jump into a little part of this, but not the beginning. I'm just going to start third paragraph in. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but Gen Z, I think I know how you feel right now. You are the great warrior, Atreyu, the young, brave lad fighting the coming demise of the world as we know it. You are in a race against the clock to stop the impending nothing and are brave enough to take it on. On your journey, you are confronted by Gamork, the terrifying wolf beast who is arguably some baby boomers, a gruesome puppet doing the bidding of the real enemy, the nothing. Also, sadly, Some of the older generation come in the guise of Morla, the ancient one, allergic to youth and who doesn't care that they don't care. Millennials, you're like the rock biter. 
a bit overhyped, but not by your own doing. Who everyone thinks has such strong hands, but actually can only afford to eat rocks and not avocados. Gen X, you're the weird guy who wears a top hat and rides a snail. Quirky and a little bit useless in the situation, but somehow still part of things. The childlike empress is everything we want to keep safe. What the fight is for. The childlike empress and all of Fantasia is our planet, its species, and its environs. And me, I'm Falcor, because it's my analogy, and I get to be Falcor. So I, I really, I got really taken by the work that young people are doing to organize right now against climate change and the denial of, of mm-hmm. older people or even if pe- older people are not denying it that they're just not doing anything right mm. so thinking about Greta Thunberg and the way that Trump makes fun of her and belittles her is just hilarious to me imagining a 70 year old man being so threatened by the power of this young warrior just mm-hmm. really started making me think of this kind of like battle that betray you if you've ever seen the movie if you haven't seen the movie go spend 3.99 on YouTube and run it or Jen's throwing a house party yeah, yeah Jen Jen's Come having over a watch to my party. place yeah I don't own a TV so from the viewing pleasures of my MacBook <laughs> well I'll find out with along with all of you what Falcor is yeah but now I, I now wow. I see you as Falcor Melissa wow. yeah oh. that's right. <laughs> it's so painful. Look, it is our very host painful. is in pain. Want to say to, a little bit why, Katie? To hear someone say they don't know what Falcor is. I mean, it's just it, it was like so integral to our childhood that it's like, I don't know. I imagined so many times that I was writing Falcor and that like I found like the books in the attic or like got to read books in the attic and like, you know. I don't know. Yeah, we were all Bastion. You know, we were we all, all hoping when we got Harry Potter that that was our never-ending story moment where we were going to open it and we were going to be a part of the story. <laughs> but I think that gen- I think you're like that next generation did. That's nice, Kitty, because you kind of straddle those two generations. Like I think Harry Potter is definitely like the the newest kind of. It's this generation Star Wars at the very least. Oh yeah. Right. You have to believe in fantasy because the reality of the present moment is is not okay is not something you want to live in yeah yeah i do think that's a good reason for thinking why fantasy is such a boom is a boom market it Um, is seeing like a a bigger even bigger boom than it did like i would say like 10 15 years ago even when or like you know when was harry did harry Potter start like at the end of the 90s like 20 something years ago yeah it's seeing a bigger boom now than it ever did then yeah, I think that the whole th- uh, speculative fiction, right? So if you can yeah. dream something into being, then then it is possible. And if you're thinking about like Butler and I'm reading N.K. Jemisin's books right now and, and thinking about science fiction and Afro- Afrofuturism too and like what's what's the next possible tomorrow. So I think there's a lot of desire for it. But yeah, so the analogy really came to me thinking about this idea of like, oh gosh, it's a young person – is the hero of our story, like most, you know, children's books. And but the ar- the, the archetypes of like Gamork, this wolf beast that's like hiding out, ready to to attack this young person for trying to to like solve the problem. That's Trump. That's our president. And then also That's the horse in the hospital. That's a horse yep. in the hospital. John. Mm-hmm. John Mulvaney. Trump is definitely the horse in the hospital. And then also thinking about Morla, who everyone's like, go see Morla, the ancient one. Like, she knows. She knows. And then she sneezes on him. And she's like, I'm allergic to you. And also, you can't do anything about it. Like, nothing can be done. And to me, actually, in more ways than Gamork or the nothing, like, thinking about Morla, like, that's what people are like, I don't know, kid. I don't know. I need my car. I don't know, kid. Solar. So where does know. where does the hopefulness come from? In in the story or in in now? Like, both, both. I want to know. I want the spoiler here. The Melissa yeah. Shaw take on this. Yeah. Well, I feel like the the hopefulness in the never ending story. I don't want to spoil that, but there is definitely a really beautiful. There's a destruction. There's a destruction in the never ending story where everything has to get put back together. And I just want to leave you with that because you've got to see it. And those of you listening at home, go see it. If you haven't seen it in years, go see it. But something has to get put back together. And, and they don't save the day. The day doesn't get saved. So, 
using the analogy and where's the hopefulness now? Like what happens if we don't save the day? Can we put things back together? Is there going to be a next? Is there a grain of the ivory tower that we can hold in our hand mm. and wish on? I don't know. So if we don't act now, I don't know. It is not a Jim Henson movie. It is real life. So that's hard. And I think it's okay to maybe acknowledge that hope is something that can both distract us and and we need it. Like I think that like we have to have hope because if not, then like, oh gosh, then why do any of us wake up? Mm -hmm. But if we're too hopeful, then people don't act because I think they're like, it'll work out. So actually like maybe it's just not going to be okay. And what we need to do is like, find the new reality together mm -hmm. well on that line on those lines there like what's the importance of writing what we're writing about right now you guys are both writing about they're very very different things but i feel they're both very important things whether or not they're using like fiction or nonfiction, or you're using like metaphorical tropes or whatnot like i think i feel they're very important things so like what's the importance behind them Jen, can I talk about your writing through this lens for a second? Definitely. Your piece has always made me think about just how dangerous capitalism is. Yeah. And the perils of capitalism. Yeah. And uh, as, as, a, as a country now, right, we might have the first socialist president. I mean, let's be honest. That's a strong possibility. Who's actively talking about what capital the, the damage that it's done to us especially neoliberalism and especially like the kind of post 80s capitalism that we've had after the reagan years so i feel like taking that on as a theme for me when i read it as a reader i'm like let's talk about it definitely i'm gonna share another fun anecdote with you that might collectively be part of my bio i um was studying finance in undergrad in addition to creative writing in french as you mentioned in the beginning katie and i had this shirt that said capitalist on it and i wore this like around campus along with these crazy vibram five finger toe shoes that i would use to run super long distances another one of my hobbies so i was this like amphibious footed <laughs> capitalist figure roaming around campus, spending a lot of time in the bookstore. And when I went in to buy my books for the beginning of the semester, I went up to one of the staff and said, you know, I'm looking for whatever the Econ 101 textbook. And this is in Ithaca, New York, and so pretty liberal place. And he looks at me and he sees my bright green t-shirt that says capitalist on it. And he goes, we replaced all those books with Marxist literature. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but where's, where's my Econ 101 textbook? <laughs> so, and you're married now. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, so it, it, was, it was funny because I, I was always drawn towards finance and economics and byproduct of having come of age in the time of the 2008 financial crisis. And so my impetus to going into that space was, hold up, like all these big impressive adults all around me, their worlds are melting down and they don't know why it's happening or what's going on. And how could there be something so powerful and so omnipresent affecting everyone's lives that no one understands? Like, how did we let this happen? And so I thought, well, that's something I want to learn more about. That's something I want to study. That's something that I think we can avoid this happening again if more people, like it was common knowledge, how the markets worked or why we have capitalism or like <laughs> what it means to be a socialist or capitalist. And is it working? Like, is it still something we want to continue? Or how do we rethink the systems mm. that we've been brought into so I, I'm not actually sure. I still have that T-shirt. I can't tell if I wear it ironically now or like <laughs> if it's doing its job. But it's it's funny to come up through it, the academic lens where it's like, oh, this makes sense. Like if you work really hard and your idea is good, it's going to be rewarded. But then you see it in practice. And that's where my career took me after college. And you're like, whoa, there's a lot of nuance here that the people element that we need to think more deeply about before we accept any kind of economic system. Mm. Mm. So mm. 
I really love that you have kind of named one of the things that Katie and I were talking about before you got here earlier was that like irony at this point. I don't think most people know anymore if what they're doing is ironic or not, if they're mm. serious or not anymore. I think the lines have blurred. So the idea of you being like, I'm not sure what I mean when I wear this shirt. I'm actually holding a cup in my hand. And I want you to imagine, dear <laughs> listeners at home, the kind well, of can glass. I, can, can I explain really quick that my other podcast that I co-host with a woman named Erica Atkins called Rosé All Day Anyways, it gave me the wine glasses that you're about to talk about for the holidays. She gave those to me. So that's the preface to this. But anyway, continue. Yeah. And the font is like the, I want you to imagine like a pink font on a wine glass that is the most bachelorette party (laughs) kind of font that you could possibly imagine. Like if you got a gift at a wedding, it's that font that's on. It's got, it's like cursive bubble letter. Yeah. They know what I mean. Magenta script. Yeah. Yeah. They know what I mean. It's like, this is like more like mauve. Yeah, you're right. This you're is right. Like it's basic rose color. Mauve. If this was a crayon color, it would be basic. It's bitch a mauve. dark rose colored, like oh. a lipstick type color that wouldn't probably look that good. Yes, this, is the, this is the lipstick that you opened and wish that you had just returned before you opened it. Like you That's knew true. it was okay. a mistake when you bought it. So, and it says on this glass, okay, because we're gonna lose people. It says Epstein didn't kill himself. That's what it says I'm on holding these it. Is, the year is 2020, <laughs> and I'm holding a wine glass that says, in the most frilly font possible, Epstein didn't kill himself. And I really think that the American aesthetic of the cute meeting the grotesque mm. has so jumped the shark. And that that's so where we are right now. I'm on TikTok a lot, and you see that a lot. I shouldn't be on TikTok because it's a really problematic app, and the Chinese government owns see, it. See, that's going to be a whole other podcast Sorry, app but where I say, Katie still doesn't understand what TikTok is. That's right. You, okay, can, that's you and I can talk about too. it. I'm on it all the time. But I, wait, I have to say, so this is why the irony, the irony question is interesting to me. The other thing I have to say before I forget to say this, because you really, you amaze me. I cannot think if I were to draw what I thought a libertarian looked like, it would be somebody wearing a capitalist t-shirt and those toe shoes. <laughs> that to me is a quintessential <laughs> libertarian. Would Those are the two most important things a libertarian could own, so... Thank you for that image in my mind. There you go. Yeah, now you yeah. know. Maybe that libertarian would probably be drinking out of this wine glass now. All that right. was like 2000 and whatever, I just feel but. politically confused at this point. But but that was you yeah. in college. I'm but that was me in now, college. I'm yeah, I didn't. I, I knew big words, but I didn't know what they meant. And probably haven't come very far since then. But I have you guys to let guide the way. So thank you. Well, before we close out, Melissa, are you going to tell us what's in the box? Well, I'm glad you asked. When Tim Cook, who is wearing a black turtleneck and a a pink robe, opens the box and reveals the next most important thing, the technology that's going to change the human, the human in the next decade, 2020, he pulls out an eye patch. And on the eye patch in red rhinestones kind of like on a sleep mask like if you could imagine Mm -hmm. it says sexy slut (laughs) on his eye patch and the reporters in the audience you know of course want to start asking questions they're like is a camera in the eye patch is there like a micro computer in the eye patch and they start really wondering like what is this what is this eye patch and tim cook is wearing it and he and he has his hook and he that's really as far as I got. That's as far as I got in the <laughs> in the sketch writing. So he's like a but capitalist I know, pirate. I know that it's like about that. vision and it's about blotting, uh, being able to like close one eye and look at the world. So, you know. So we don't even know what this piece of writing means yet. I'm, no, I mean, I, I'm writing it while we're on this podcast. I'm telling you, this is a live I love it. experience. I love it. It is. It was originally going to be an eye mask, but then I realized it would actually be an eye patch. But I I just can't get over it. Like, I want to know, is it lowercase I 
patch. Yeah. Is that how Don't this you is understand it? how brilliant <laughs> so good. this conceit is yet? It's so good. I it's the eye I, 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 I the person, I the apple, I the viewing yeah, apple. We're just apparatus. we're saying right now TM Melissa Shaw. Thank you. It's trademarked. The eye patch. Verbal ta- trademark right there. Oh my gosh. Legally this is binding, as right? A per- as a person who knows trademark law in and out right now. TM. TM yeah, Melissa Shaw. <laughs> Melissa Shaw. Thank you for protecting my the perpetuity of the future. Yes, I think that's the that's right going to retail really high. Uh, that is potential. Do you get depending this? how many Look, gigs are in there. It's at least thirty nine ninety five at Uniqlo. Or if you bought it on YouTube for three ninety nine, I wouldn't be upset either. I want to thank you both very much for being on because that was very entertaining just now, and all the the last whole hour has been really great. The last whole like lifetime with you guys has been That's great. That's true, the last like year has been wonderful have, with our little like writing group. Do we have a name for our writing group, by the way? I think the WhatsApp is awesome writing people. Do we have to trademark that? <laughs> TM, trademark, <laughs> Katie Rainey, Jen Horbitsky, Melissa Shaw. You know, awesome it could be like people. ACW, you know, APW. No. W W P what what is it? AWP. AWP AWP Awesome Writing People. Yeah, but see they've already trademarked that. So, so we're we're fucked. we're fucked. Never mind. Formerly yeah, known as <laughs> We are the writing group formerly Love you known guys. as Awesome Writing People. Thank you guys for being on. Thank you Katie Rennie. Thank you Jeff. Thanks listeners. Thanks. I Katie. hope you listen. Melissa. <laughs> Okay, that's it for today's episode. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review on whichever platform you're listening. You can get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Animal Riot Press or through our website, AnimalRiotPress.com. This has been the 47th episode of the Animal Riot Podcast with me, your host, Katie Rainey, and featuring Jennifer Warbitsky and Melissa Shaw. Our transcripts for our deaf and hard of hearing animals are provided by Jonathan Kay. This episode was cut by our podcast assistant, Dylan Thomas, and we are produced by me, Katie Rainey. See you later, you filthy animals. Belly.